When you play the game of thrones, you win or you die. There is no middle ground. Cersei of the House Lannister, Queen Regent, the self-proclaimed Light of the West and Lady of Castle Rock, the eldest child and the only daughter of Lord Tywin and Lady Joanna Lannister, a poisonous embodiment of fear and resentment, hidden beneath great splendour and beauty. We first meet him in the first book of A Song of Ice and Fire, but it's only in A Feast for Crows that we get to see the world from her perspective. And if we had tried to deceive ourselves into believing there was something unselfish and compassionate hidden in this character, this belief got completely destroyed. Wealth, beauty, position and vanity are the spheres which Cersei inhabits and channels. Along with her false belief in her supremacy, it obscures her reason, constantly driving her closer to her downfall. Low cunning, betrayal, promiscuity and fear are the four horsemen of the apocalypse dwelling entrenched in her soul. In Circe, the riches of the material sphere are exaggerated, while the wealth of the transcendental and moral values is extinguished. All what the underworld can offer, but also all it takes in retaliation, is portrayed in an ever-worsening quid pro quo through this chaotic, terrible mother aspect of the mother archetype. Are even the tears she sheds in private trickery? Is there truly no limit to her ruthlessness, or is it all just a reflection of the rebellion of a woman predestined to obey at all costs by the society, and of a mother trying to protect her children? In this video, we'll look at the psychological profile, relationships, mythological symbolism and dream analysis of Cersei Lannister in an attempt to uncover her full personality. Background Although Cersei was a firstborn, the order of succession in Westeros, with the exception of Dawn, always favours the male heir. She nonetheless feels entitled to inherit, and she goes as far as attempting to proclaim herself the Queen of Westeros. Her true desire is to establish herself on the Iron Throne in full right, and use her children for that purpose. Before we analyse that, let's look at how Cersei's childhood shaped her behaviour and contributed to the formation of her current personality. Her father's eyes had always been unsettling, pale green, almost luminous, flecked with gold. His eyes could see inside you, could see how weak and worthless and ugly you were down deep. When he looked at you, you knew. As I discussed in the video about Tywin, both Cersei and Jaime are narcissistic extensions of Tywin, his golden children. However, they each adopt a different role in the narcissistic family system. In Cersei's case, she identifies with the aggressor, her father, and attempts to emulate him. She's growing up under the ideology of Lannister superiority, but at the same time is heavily influenced by the conflicting concept of her own inferiority, which is imposed on her because of her womanhood, which she learns to despise and see as a debilitating weakness. This is reinforced by the treatment of her father, combined with the status quo of the society and witnessing Eris's humiliation of her mother and her subsequent death in childbirth. This is later reflected in the way she treats other women, including the highborn ones, who are never even considered her rivals, but are only seen as whores. She subconsciously tries to become a copy of her father, which can be seen as a sort of a coping mechanism or a manner to free oneself and retake the control of one's own life, but also to get in the position of power in order to take revenge on the world out of resentment. Although Cersei considers herself the only true son her father ever had, the truth is that Tyrion is the most veritable copy of Tywin. Cersei isn't a good ruler, nor is she a good strategist, as her paranoia and hubris always get the better of her, and her ego prevents her from understanding other people's intentions and motivations, as she can't see anyone existing outside herself. At the same time, the quote above explains succinctly where this mainly stems from. Cersei believes that she herself has always been rotten, for which it's impossible for her to see the world in a different light. Everyone around her is seen as vicious and ugly, for which no one's ever good enough. The only infallible figures in her eyes were Rhaegar and Jaime. Rhaegar was seen as a godlike figure, an image of her utmost fantasy, a representation of her ego in its complete power, a desire resulting from the failure of individuation, resulting in autoeroticism and egocentrism, and Jaime as her copy, an image of herself of which she was enamoured. 
which, when it began to differentiate itself, was discarded as it no longer resembled herself. Fear of abandonment. Where the child fails to get support from the mother in the process of exploration of the world, conflict between the guilt that arises from abandoning the mother and rage at being unable to develop oneself results in repression of the conflict into the shadow, which is a reaction that arises from the inability to defend oneself against the conflict, where it takes the form of a complex. This then results in the development of an unconscious fear of abandonment and an ability to see others in their wholeness, but only as either all good or all bad. In Circe's case, her mother was lost abruptly when she was only seven, and the father failed to provide the support needed, as the children were seen mainly as his own extensions rather than individuals. Combined with her temperament, mainly being high neuroticism, aggression and extroversion, and the lack of maternal support, feminine trait, and excessiveness of paternal control, overly effective masculine trait, she developed a rather one-sided view of the world, with a focus on her ego in the centre. This also happened as a revolting response to feeling unheard and unseen, unacknowledged, manipulated, not good enough, unloved and having to remain inauthentic. This overinflation of ego is somewhat compensatory for low self-esteem. In this sense, Circe indeed carries Tywin's legacy, as hers is the case of textbook narcissism, which we'll look at later. The Valencar Prophecy and the Murder of Malara Heatherspoon before we move on to the diagnostical section, it's important to address the prophecy of Maggie the Frog if we want to comprehend Cersei's motivations, as it very much guides a great number of her actions. Contrary to reason, Cersei decides to believe some shaggy old hag's prophecy, and it becomes the root of her fear and madness. In Game of Thrones, prophecies are considered very fickle and precarious, but yet there is some truth to them. But maybe the true reasons prophecies come true is exactly because the person's actions are guided by the fear or desire of the fulfilment. For example, a man is told he'll die beneath a wall, so he avoids them all, but in the end he dies beneath a tavern called the Wall. Why does Cersei decide the prophecy is true? Both out of fear and desire, which set her on a path of no return that begins with the murder of her friend, Melara Heatherspoon. Maggie tells her she'll be a queen which is something she wants, but she also warns her about the way she'll die, which is obviously something she wishes to prevent. She could still hear Malara Heatherspoon insisting that if they never spoke about the prophecies, they would not come true. She was not so silent in the well, though. From this thought alone, we can identify where lies the core of the problem. Had Cersei heeded Malara's advice and chosen an action and gained mastery over her impulses and self-control, Beginning with abstaining from pushing Malara, or in other words, had she seen her flaws and changed her character, it's very likely that none of the prophesies would have happened. She chose the contrary, however. It's quite likely that Cersei sought action from Malara, as she would from Jamie or her father, but unlike them, she declined, for which she pushed her into the well. Malara might have posed a mirror in front of Cersei, which threatened destruction of the illusional image of the truth Cersei had constructed. She thus raised the only other person who knew of the prophecy and rebelled against the truth and the fate's defiance. For the same reason, she threw the potion into Maggie's eyes. We can therefore identify fear and lust as the driving forces of her character. Maggie speaks of loss, pain and death, or in other words, the reality of life, which Cersei aims to destroy as it threatens her fantasy, that is, all that she desires. She willingly chooses to be naive, as it's lust for power that drives her. We can see, as the story unravels, how Cersei fulfills the prophecy through the decisions she makes. As she's always believed that Tyrion had been predestined to be her downfall, her loathing created her enemy out of him. I will hurt you for this. The day will come when you think you're safe and happy, and your joy will turn to ashes in your mouth. Same goes for Jaime, who became estranged from her and could potentially be the Valencar, as he's the younger of the twins. Although he doesn't have a hand and the prophecy mentions hands, but you get the point. It's also quite likely it'll be someone completely else, as the prophecy doesn't say your little brother, Valencar, but THE Valencar, 
it could also be the other queen's little brother. Regardless of that, it'll be the fruit of Cersei's actions that'll be her undoing. Psychological Profile Narcissistic and Antisocial Personality Disorder You cannot eat love, nor buy a horse with it, nor warm your horse on a cold night. Cersei heard Tywin tell Jaime when he was Tommen's age. This kind of narcissism was heavily shaped by the relationship between a narcissistic father and daughter. In Cersei's case, hypercriticism and denigration of the narcissistic father prevented development of the sense of worthiness, which led to resentment and therefore reenaction of the same traumas endured in childhood. Her dreams weren't even asked about, high expectations were imposed on her, and yet she was falling short of Tywin's standard, and his critical voice became her inner critic. All this, combined, led to development of excessive perfectionism and the drive to be number one at all costs. The identification with her father's persona, Tywin with Fitz, an embodiment of his wishful projections, I'm the only son he ever had, combined with her temperament and beliefs shaped by the Valonqar prophecy, created a possessive, glib and paranoid individual. She disregards the needs of others, lacks empathy, is arrogant, exploitative and haughty, doesn't care about others unless they admire or obey her, believes that she's special and misunderstood by others, fantasizes about ruling the Seven Kingdoms and expects others to comply with her expectations. All signs of NPD. To what extent these traits would manifest themselves without outer input is difficult to say, but the fact that Cersei was physically abusing Tyrion and killed a friend at a young age for reasons other than self-defense or matters of war and expressed no remorse is indicative of significant psychopathology. Even though we don't know the exact circumstances, she's more haunted by the prophecy, because it affects herself, than the act of murder, or rather she's so afraid for herself that she's willing to crush others, even though it's only based on fantastical premises. She ruthlessly tortures and exploits without any compassion whatsoever, if it's needed to meet her ends. NPD is so prominent here that it overlaps with antisocial personality disorder, or psychopathy, which could also be diagnosed as she's impulsive, aggressive and manipulative since a young age, violates social norms, rationalizes and justifies violent behavior, and displays superficial charm. Although there are situations in which it seems that she cares for her children, it couldn't be considered the kind of love that accepts one's individuality and encourages one to grow. It's possessive, narcissistic and selfish. Paranoid Personality Disorder Cersei's paranoia is indeed another textbook example. She persistently suspects that others are plotting to harm or betray her without sufficient basis, she misinterprets any situation or remark as a disloyal slight and is unwilling to forgive them. She's quick to counterattack and react with anger frequently, has problems with close relationships because of overt argumentativeness and constant complaining. She pretends to appear rational and unemotional, but hostile and stubborn expressions are predominant. Because of preconceived negative notions of others' intentions, any behaviour reinforces the idea of their enmity. Just to be clear, it's tactically necessary to choose whom to trust in such a position of power, but it becomes pathological when mistrust is extended on absolutely everyone. A good example of this would be the Mad King, Aerys Targaryen. Inflated consciousness. From the psychoanalytical point of view, what occurs in Cersei's consciousness is inflation, which is adoption of an exaggerated sense of self-importance, which compensates feelings of inferiority. This prohibits any realization of outer or inner phenomena, including comprehension of one's or other's actions, and is basically what could be referred to as being blinded by one's own ego. When Cersei bizarrely blames the washerwomen for shrinking her gowns when, in reality, they don't fit her because she gained weight due to a lavish lifestyle, is perhaps the moment that offers us the greatest insight into the core of the complexes of Cersei's character. Its bedrock is self-deception, from which stems a self-image of perfection and the search for outward causes for one's own wrongdoing, driven by the fear of the decomposition of this godlike image which is in reality be ridden with flaws and greed invisible to and repressed by the individual. Cersei's shadow. Under the veneer of arrogance and pride lies self-loathing, which leads to loathing others. 
One's repressed negative traits or one's shadow are then projected onto others. How Cersei criticizes others tells us a great deal about her own being. Arguably, the person she despised the most was Robert, and in an ironic juxtaposition, she later starts to emulate his worst traits. She becomes sexually promiscuous, feasts and drinks a lot, gets bored of ruling, lets herself go and sleeps round. After all, as Carl Jung smartly once pointed out, we always see our unavowed mistakes in our opponent. Dream Analysis The iPhone dream perfectly portrays how Cersei truly feels about herself and others. Her elevated ego sits on the throne and looks conceitedly in the inferior rest of the world, which only pleases her when it's begging. A threat to her ego is the dwarf, who threatens to reveal her true nature represented by her nakedness, as he's the first one to point it out to others. Everyone laughs at this true self in the dream, which reflects the reality. We know the people despise Cersei, and those who know her personally don't think of her in high terms either. Blood tends to represent one's energy and sense of existence in dreams. Our motive to live may be depicted as blood. This would certainly make sense here, since Cersei's world revolves around sitting the Iron Throne. It's her utmost goal and desire. She gets so consumed by it that it destroys her, for which we could tell with great certainty that her demise will revolve around the consequences of the pursuit of this goal. All the while, Tyrion dances below and laughs. Apart from his appearance symbolically representing the trickster archetype, whose role is to trick us into becoming honest with ourselves, it could very well mean that Tyrion will play a significant part in her downfall. Relationships Cersei and her children As Cersei is a continuation of narcissism introduced into the family by Tywin, she extends this onto her own children and converts them into her extensions. The child that was worst off here was Joffrey, who adopted the role of a so-called fly monkey and a golden child in the narcissistic family setting. Given his history and behaviour, we could establish with great certainty that Joffrey was afflicted by the conduct disorder, which often precedes the development of antisocial personality disorder, also called psychopathy or sociopathy, with the first sign of it going back to the occasion when he slid the cat open to see if there were kittens inside, as we could consider it animal torture, the first major red flag. And of course, he later tortures Sansa both physically and emotionally, sends an assassin after Bran, treats Sandor as his dog, and the list goes on and on. It seems that Joffrey is Cersei's favourite child because he's her veritable clone, for which she also justifies even his most senseless behaviour. Many corroborate that it was Cersei's influence that spoiled him. You are my darling boy and the world will be exactly as you want it to be. As for Tommen, he's the needy sibling. He's infantilized by Cersei to prevent him from gaining his independence. His well-natured and meek character makes him an ideal object for manipulation, and these traits might eventually be his downfall. He might be driven mad, just like on the show. He will keep coming into conflict between his mother and his wife, unless he develops a more rebellious and independent character. Marjorie tells Tommen that he should learn to be the king, which Cersei considers as being cheated of her arrow in the sun. On Tommen, we can beautifully see the conflict between the mother and the wife, who compete for the son. A good sign is, though, that Tommen hasn't developed an exaggeratingly symbiotic behaviour and is trying to fight the dragon, the negative aspect of the feminine archetype embodied by Cersei, or to extract and develop the ego out of the unconscious. Only through the development of autonomy can he save his ego from being swallowed by the dragon. Just like in the myth of Perseus, he must kill the terrible mother to win Andromeda. Myrcella is the neutral sibling with the potential to be the scapegoated child, or the one that questions and resists the narcissistic system. We don't know much about her history, though. It seems she hasn't been under the influence of Cersei March, fortunately, and her confidence and intelligence might shield her from becoming another one of her victims. She's referred to as the sibling with the highest potential to rule. The reason I think Cersei isn't interested in her is that she can't use her directly, as she's a female, and therefore of lesser importance in the line of succession. Cersei and Jaime How could I ever have loved that wretched creature? She wondered after he had gone. He was your twin, your shadow, your other half, another voice whispered. 
Once, perhaps, she thought. No longer. He has become a stranger to me. This quote alone indicates how Cersei views Jamie as her shadow, that is something subjected to herself. She only refers to him in terms of her own self, and therefore doesn't see him as an individual. What we're talking about here isn't her shadow, however, but her animus, that is, the male counterpart of the feminine psyche that is projected onto Jaime. Cersei is dominated by her animus, for which she's possessed by her opinions, and she isn't too discriminating about them. She's full of ingrained prejudices. For the same reason, she's not guided by reason, but by concepts constructed by her whimsical fantasy. The only difference is that, blinded by her animus, Cersei perceives herself as a highly reasonable being with masculine qualities and considers other women as stupid or whores. When it comes to her relationship with Jaime, his anima, the female counterpart of the masculine psyche, is submissive, while Cersei's animus is dominating. For this reason, she's only interested in him as long as he's her loyal dog. Cersei's animus constructs an image of Jaime, which is her own image. It's only this image of which is enamoured, and as soon as it's distorted on the physical, when he's maimed, and later psychological, when he develops his own will level, she loses interest in him. Jaime, on the other hand, is possessed by his anima, for which he acts under the influence of his feelings for Cersei and is blinded by them. The main reason they fell in love with each other is that they each saw the other as their own self. And of course Cersei uses this to manipulate him. If you'd like me to dissect the twins as further, and discuss the parallels between Jaime and Cersei and twins in mythology, let me know in the comments. Cersei, Sansa, Daenerys. The crone, the maid, and the queen. Sansa is the younger Cersei, as she constructs for herself an ideal world she deceives herself resembles the outer world, for which in the end she suffers terribly. Their temperaments can't be compared, but their initial naivety, yes. Young Cersei is very naive in regards to her wishes, just like Sansa, but in contrast to Sansa, Cersei fights to destroy everything and everyone who isn't aligned with her fantasy, while Sansa is very passive. Young Cersei is naive and too ruthless, Sansa is naive and too innocent. The balance and reconciliation between all these traits is represented by Daenerys. Through her, we witness the difficulty of accomplishing individuation. She is naive because she sees the contrast between the dream of childhood and the reality of life, and she consciously decides to choose the latter, despite her desires. She chooses responsibility, and is without a doubt the most mature out of the three. If we compare Daenerys and Cersei, we come to the conclusion that despite the disadvantages that women face in the world of Game of Thrones, in this case those regarding ruling and inheriting, Daenerys gains respect and is venerated because of her deeds and accomplishments. She genuinely cares for the people and is willing to sacrifice herself in the process, for which she parallels Jon Snow. On the other hand, Cersei is extremely selfish, which alone makes her unfit for ruling, and therefore never gains any supporters in any other way than through her bed. She doesn't care about how many people it takes to die for her ends. While Daenerys wants no bloodshed, Cersei is bloodthirsty. It is blood I need, not water. They represent two aspects of the mother archetype, for which I believe that they will have to confront each other at some point. Mythology Cersei's name Although George Martin said that Cersei wasn't based on the character of Cersei from the Odyssey, there are some parallels between the two characters and the counterpart of Cersei, Calypso, both aspects of the terrible mother archetype, for which I'd say he did take some inspiration from it. Her name could be derived either from Cersei or from the French word Ceris, which stands for cherry or crimson. Seven Deadly Sins Cersei represents the countering force to the Seven Gods, as she embodies seven deadly sins. Gluttony, fornication, avarice, despondency, wrath, sloth, vainglory, and hubris. This is reflected in the clash between the Faith and Cersei. Terrible Mother Archetype The Terrible Mother Archetype is perceived through death and destruction, danger, hunger, war, and disease. The Terrible Mother is the life-consuming darkness represented in mythology through monsters and goddesses of war and hunt. Best examples would be the figures of Tiamat, Gorgon, Kali, Hecate, Artemis or Ishtar. She is the seductress, enchantress and temptress. 
She demands blood of the men to be satisfied and destroys all that lives. Her function is prevention of independence, enhancement of fixation, captivity and portrayal of freedom as a danger. For this reason, she is depicted in the symbol of the spider which represents ensnarement. This is brilliantly depicted in the movie Enemy, which I discussed in one of my previous videos you can watch here. The negative aspect of the mother archetype also has transformative powers, which are reflected in the obstacles that must be overcome during emergence from all situations, or birth, as well as transformation of the living into dead. The apparent safety of the familiar associated with this aspect is an illusion that keeps oneself in the dark and helpless but comfortable. Amidst the sea of potential, however, one remains nothing, for which he must emerge from it to become something. Lady of the Beast I discussed the positive aspect of this archetype in my video about Sansa and Sandor's archetypal analysis, which I recommend you to check out. As I mentioned there, Cersei represents its negative aspect. Both have Aphrodite-like qualities, and Sansa is the former Cersei in regard to her naivety, self-deception, and the dream of childhood and fantasy, and in mythology, Lady of the Beasts is usually represented as surrounded by wolves or lions. The dynamics between Sansa and Cersei give us a great insight into how we're dealing with the one and the same archetypal character, despite the striking disparities. For this reason, I suspect that Sansa will eventually either steer her character development towards transformation into a Cersei-like figure, the cunning seductress, or undergo the process of individuation, which began through her relationship with Sandor Clegane successfully, and reconcile power and dominance with morality and justness, or turn into a Daenerys-like figure. The female character which best represents this process, apart from Daenerys, is Lyanna Stark, who was the woman, the mother and the warrior all in one. Lady of the Beasts and the Great Mother developed. We could hypothesize that she embodied the principle of natural order, which holds chaos at bay and rules over it, as with her death, order falls apart and the world is plunged into chaos. In Greek mythology, Circe is the daughter of the sun god Helios. This portrayal isn't accidental, as it's very common in mythology for this aspect to be associated with lions and sun, the representation of fire as destroyer and creator, and the power to give and take life. She's a powerful, devastatingly beautiful enchantress. She's skilled in the art of potions, and she can turn men into animals. She bewitched Odysseus's men by giving them poisonous drugs, and turn them into swine. She's depicted as surrounded by wolves and lions she tamed. Interestingly, Circe has two brothers and she and Odysseus had three children together. Calypso, on the other hand, uses lies in the sea to enchant Odysseus and hold him captive for seven years in hopes of marrying him. Circe is more caring and Calypso more egocentric. They are, however, two aspects of the same figure. Much like Circe, they provoke the lowest in men, use their charms and beauty to seduce them, and spurn and poison those who refuse to obey them. 